Uh, Thomas has been in the entertainment industry for 15 years. Uh, he's a founder of Blocks World, which sold to Linden Labs last year, and, um, and has now left Desura to run his own business and arrange a games festival Correct. in Sweden, in his native Sweden, focusing yes. on, um, on development and creation. Um, he's seen a lot of games uh, from a publisher's perspective and mm -hmm. has uh, some wonderful insights that he's actually going to share with us this morning. So a lot of, a lot of the insights are going to come from the, the 10 things that will sell um, the indie, your indie game. So really geared towards the indie startup developers. And um, without further ado, I'll hand it over. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Um, so my name is, is Thomas Alström, and I'm here to give you some advice on how to um, improve the sales of your indie game. Um, I will do it from a very kind of, of general startup perspective. Um, I'm not sure how many of you guys are, are indie developers? No? Pretty much anyone? Everyone? Makes sense. Uh, and how many of you are in a kind of a startup phase? Yeah, most of you? Okay, that's great. Um, I will, my advice will be pretty personal, and, and as we heard, uh, it will be based on my experience from working with uh, uh, distribution and publishing at Desura. Uh, do you know Desura? You know, yeah, yeah? So, so Desura is like Steam for indie games. It's a distribution channel, it's a web page, it's a client um, where you can like, distribute your games and customers can come and buy your game. We have our own client, um, and yeah, it works very much like Steam, but, but we focus on, on indie games. Um, and also from, from the um, very innovative iPad game Bloxworld. I was a co-founder of, uh, of Bloxworld, um, which can be described as a virtual Lego for the iPad. How many of you have heard about Bloxworld? No one. Terry, fantastic. <laughs> so, so, yeah, you heard about it, because I emailed you yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, you got the introduction. Um, this is my brag board because when I speak like this, you are sitting in the audience thinking, who is that guy? Um, this is my brag board. I've been around in the games industry for about 15 years. I have this instead of uh, like a boring CV, so I recommend that every one of you have your own brag board. It's very nice with all the colorful log log types. So I've been doing uh, startups. I'm kind of a serial entrepreneur. Uh, about half of these companies I've been co-founding myself uh, alone or with friends. Um, and as we heard recently, I've been working with Desura, uh, Linden Lab, bought a company that I founded. And right now I have my own uh, uh, company, Incredible Concepts, where I will help uh, indie developers to boost their, their business and so forth. Uh, okay? So, I first set the headline, 10 advice that we sell more indie games. And then I thought that, let's, I'll, I'll Google and see what kind of advice I can find. I can collect the best advices. So I Googled for five minutes, and I found a lot of advices. At the same time, I thought that it doesn't really make sense for me to Google for five minutes and then tell you what I found, because you can do that yourself. So I decided to turn it around, turn it around and, and be a bit more personal to look at myself, what kind of advices has been good for me. Um, so, it may be, yeah, so it will be pretty, pretty personal. Uh, I hope it will make sense for you as well. Um, OK. So at startup, you know, you have just decided that you want to make games for a living. The first one, I think that <laughs> if you are making games as a hobby, you don't have to care about this. Just follow your passion. And I meet a lot of developers saying that, you know, business is bad, you know. If, we, you know, if you're an indie developer, you should just follow your passion, just do what is fun. And that's great, especially if you're making games as a hobby. But if you want to live, out of making games, if you want to quit your day job, you have to learn how to run a business. You have to become an entrepreneur, a businessman, because there's a lot of things you have to know. You have to know about like, sales, marketing, uh, acquisition, negotiations, contract negotiations, uh, segmentation, differentiation, all that kind of stuff. So you can't just be a game developer. You have to be an entrepreneur as well. And if you think that, that that's fun, just buy a book or just Google, uh, maybe you can find some governmental program for, for young startups or whatever. Um, or if you think that's boring, and I know a lot of game developers think that the business side is really boring, find a partner. Find someone that loves business that can complement you um, doing that. Quite important. Does that make sense? Yeah, kind of. <laughs> um, great, so advice number two. And this might sound a bit obvious, but for me, working with distribution publishing at the Sura, 
I handled all the incoming uh, game submissions for the Sura. That's a dream job, right? <laughs> you know, I, I've always dreamt of having that position to get all this incoming stuff and be the, the gatekeeper. Uh, the Sura has a very open policy, so we kind of publish every, you know, basically everything that we get uh, above a decent level. Uh, but to my surprise, reviewing submissions, it's not that fun because you know, most of the games that we get and the most of the game that we see are just kind of pale copies of existing games. Um, there are very, very few games that actually add something to game genre. And I know it sounds very, very obvious, but I really want you to think about this. How can I be unique? How can you be unique? And how can, can your game be unique? For example, the Blocks World, the screenshot you see is from, is from uh, Blocks World. I mean, we decided that we wanted to make a game, but we didn't want to make a game game because there are already too many games. There are too many games out there. We wanted to do something different. So we looked around in the physical world for this game. Uh, and just we heard about Sandbox before, uh, where the creation is very central. We had the same idea with Blocks World. We want to make a game that is not only about leisure. We want to make a game where you can create and build stuff and learn stuff. So we were really inspired by Lego. We discovered that no one had really you know, ported the, 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 the physical toy Lego into the digital world. Not really successfully, at least. So that's why what we did. So, so Blocks World can be described, be, be described as, a, as a virtual Lego. And that made us um, quite unique. So that's good, that's good advice, I think. OK? <clears throat> also, if you're an indie developer, a startup, you have a very small team. There are maybe one, two, or three people, maybe just one guy. Um, it's pretty difficult to make an. Uh, epic RPG game with vast landscapes and all that kind of stuff because it's very difficult for you to master all the skills that's required to make this kind of, of game. So I think that you should really carefully look at yourself and see what your skills are and what your weaknesses are. And instead of, instead of trying to cover up for the weaknesses, use the weaknesses to make something cool instead, to make something unique. I mean, for example, if you're just a one-man show, you're one programmer, you're a skilled programmer, you have no artist, um, use procedurally generated art. Or like this game, um, Trace Vector, they have really cool just line drawing algorithms and particle effects, and they have a very, very minimalistic game um, that's, that's really cool. And you know, taking those weaknesses, make something unique of it. I think a good example is uh, Thomas Was Alone. You know about that game, right? A couple of years old right now. It's very, very nice. Made out of one guy, Mike, right? Mike Bethel, something like that, yeah? Um, very, very minimalistic art made by one guy. It's very, very unique. Um, and it was kind of the same with Bloxwell as well, because when we started making Bloxwell, we had no artist. So Martin, one of the programmers, he also a, a scientist. Um, he's been studying AI and logics for many years. He was the guy with the most artistic <laughs> capabilities. Um, but he, he didn't know how to use you know, Photoshop or anything. So he just improvised. So we made all the, all the art at least the, the 2D assets in Keynote, you know, the, uh, the PowerPoint uh, from, from Apple. So everything was made in Keynote. And we used a Blender to make some 3D art, but that, made, that gave us a very spe special look. And when we first showed the game to people, we always apologized for, for the simplistic artwork. We said that, oh, sorry about the simplistic artwork. It's very minimalistic. I mean, as soon as we get that funding, we will add more cool graphics and all that stuff. And we were surprised by the reaction because everyone said, no, 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 you have, you have to keep it this way because this differentiates you against everything else. It looks like nothing else. Someone said that our game looks like it was made by Ikea. I'm not sure if that's positive, but um, <laughs> it, was, it was unique at least. <laughs> okay. What else? Also, kind of obvious, user testing. But as a very small indie developer, you're really passionate about your game, and you show it to your friends, and then you show it to your neighbors, and then you show it to your parents, and your brothers and sister, and everyone will say like, oh, this game is awesome, because they want to be nice to you. Um, so I think it's very, very important that you try the game on people that you don't know, that you don't relate to. For Bloxwell, we went to a school, and we asked the teachers if we could borrow kids, uh, kids that we didn't know or didn't relate to. <laughs> And, and immediately, we got a line of, of, of kids like, I love games, can I try it? Like, no, I want to try my games on the guys over there that didn't react when they heard about my game. Um, so, so try your game on people that are not so passionate about what you do. 
and you will get some real good answers. And I'm not a big fan of those big data collections, at, at least not at, at the, during the development in the startup phase. Um, I love over the shoulder testing. Just having someone test the game, watch over the shoulder, try not to interfere, because it's very easy when, the, when they get stuck in the game, it's very easy to like, you know, you should go to the right over here. And yeah, like, the game is fine, I promise you. So you just have to, you know, hold, hold that back and watch, take notes. So for Blocks World, we tried it on five to 10 kids, and then we saw that the, the issues were repeating, so we didn't have to test on more people. I took a lot of notes, page up and page down, and I went back to the programmers. These are the issues. But, yeah, so, and then we iterated. We tried to fix those issues uh, and tried to cut the corners, so to speak. Um, and then we tested again. The same kids, tried to get some new kids, tested again, and they would get stuck on something else, and then we iterated. Um, so over the shoulder testing in the early stage, it's awesome. <laughs> yeah, to succeed, you need a, a good game, of course, but you also need a big portion of luck and timing. You know, a lot of the big hits are, you know, good games, good handcraft, good people, but they were like lucky in some way. So how do you plan for luck? I mean, if you have a, a business plan or a strategy document, you should have a plan for how to get lucky, <laughs> so to speak. Um, and that was also part of, of the Bloxwell strategy. We decided that, you know, we don't know where to find this publisher, or where to find this investor, or who is, yeah. So, uh, so we decided to just expose ourselves for opportunities, because you never know where the opportunity are. So we just, you know, tried to meet as many people as possible. We went to the, all the trade show, we booked meetings with everyone, we went to GDC, we booked meetings with distribution channels, publishers, uh, press. Uh, we, we actually booked meetings with other game developers, which could be kind of awkward when two developers pitch to each other and, and suddenly if you find out that, you know, we were pitching to each other kind of, no one had no any money and stuff like that. But the good thing is that suddenly you meet someone, it's like, ah, oh, this game is good. I know someone that are looking for a game like this or I've seen something. Have you read this article? So you be, get exposed for, for, uh, uh, for opportunities. So I think that's, that's very important. Um, I mean, if you're looking for a publisher, don't just talk to the two publishers that you know about. Go and talk to everyone and ask questions. Um, okay? Advice number six. <laughs> this is a tricky one. Be a star. Uh, you know, <coughs> all the kids out there, they want to become game developers. I took two kids myself. They don't want to be rock stars. That's lame. Uh, you know, their father wanted to be a rock star. It's less lame. They don't want to be a movie star. What's that? Uh, they want to be game developers. So I don't think that you understand how cool you are because you are the new rock stars, kind of. So, of course, you have to market your game, but I think there's a good opportunity for you to market yourself as well because you are, you are good role models. People look up to you. If you say stuff that are, that's interesting, people will listen. You will get followers. So I think that when you plan your marketing strategies, um, put yourself, maybe not in the middle, but at the side at least, um, and try to get followers by writing interesting stuff, posting stuff on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube channels, and be very personal, especially if you're a small developer. I think people are very interested in you. And uh, I mean, it's, it's cool if you are uh, blogging about very complex physics algorithms. That, that's cool for a handful of people. But if you blog about how you make the game, you might share some code, give people insights so the, the, the big audience that are dreaming about game, being a game developer will follow you and think that you're relevant. They will also buy your game, for sure. Does that make sense? Do you want to be stars? Yeah. 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 I have my star, too. <laughs> So, okay, it's time to release the game. <laughs> so when we launched Blocks World, I Googled, I Google a lot. I Googled um, for a couple of hours and I found a lot of advices on how to release an indie game successfully. I found maybe 30, 40, 50 different advices. So I was like overwhelmed. I, I can't do all this, this is too much. Where should I start? So I wrote down all the devices on a paper, or in the computer, of course. <clears throat> no one uses paper anymore. So I wrote down all the advices, and then I made a roadmap, like one month before the release, one week before the release, 
at release, the actual release, one week after, or one month after. And then I mapped out all those actions onto those roadmap. And then I had a really nice launch plan with loads of activities, um, which was really, really useful. And since I mapped them up over time, it wasn't really overwhelming anymore. So that's a really good, good thing. And try to be bold. Try to add some stuff to your launch plan that is crazy. For Bloxworld, I rented a hot air balloon because I got this crazy idea because I wanted to be unique. Let's be the company that releases the app from the highest position. Maybe we can get into Guinness World of Records, maybe. Um, so I got this hot air balloon for free from the local university. <laughs> So that was the idea. Unfortunately, you cannot fly in hot air balloon in October in Sweden, it turned out. So I have to cancel those things. But, but try to be bold and, and do crazy stuff. Do unexpected stuff. And don't rent air balloons in, in October uh, in, uh, in Northern Europe. Promotion material. Oh, it's so important. This is the best advice. Because at Desura, you know, I was surprised at how many developers spend like one year, two years, three years making this game, passionate about the game. But the promotion material was done in an afternoon. And promotion material, I mean like the video trailer, the screenshots, and the icon, all the images, and all that kind of nice stuff, the logotype and all that kind of stuff, the basic stuff. So you have to um, spend time on the promotion material. It's so important. And good promotion material will increase the chance of you being uh, featured. For example, at Desura, I actually turned down the game, games, where the game was pretty good, but the promotion material was lousy. And I also did the opposite. I approved games with nice promotion material where the game was so and so. So if you have good promotions and you ask the Desura staff or any of the other channels, if you have good promotion material, they will much more likely um, feature you. And being featured is so important these days, you know. Uh, I think I will, I will Jump this one and go for the last one. So you released your game. After one week, you check the statistics. Maybe you launched it on the Sura. Uh, and you see that you sold eight copies. Happens all the time. And you're like, OK, what am I supposed to do now? You didn't really get into Steam, and, and everything looks dark. And in that case, I think the bundles are really good right now. Um, when I look at the statistics at, at, at the Sura, if you get on the Sura and then get on one of the bundles, it will drive a lot of traffic. Um, Maybe obvious, but uh, I see a lot of indie developers that hasn't really thought about that. And it's, it's relatively easy to get into a bundle um, still. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm not working for Desura anymore, but the Desura staff handles Indie Royale and the Daily Royale. So if you want to, me to make some introductions for you or anything like that, to be in one of these uh, bundles, just let me know. Um, Okie doke. So that's it, basically. Um, you will find me on Twitter and in the bar later tonight. So if you have questions, ask them now or, or later. <laughs> Do we have any questions from the floor? Don't be shy. There you go. Don't be shy, always works. <laughs> so uh, what, in uh, your opinion, is the... Um, the best time to start uh, uh, doing PR or, uh, or starting to get your game out before release? Is it a year, six yeah. months, a month? It's a good question because on one side you want to start talking as early as possible, to start to get traction and, and start to get interest. On the other side you don't want to show up something that's not really you know, good yet. If you, if you show up something that's not good enough, people will think that that game is lousy and you will never get that guy back. But, my personal opinion is that the earlier, the better. You just have to be very, very selective with what you show. So if you, I mean, you can, you can start talking about your game even before you, you start coding it. Show concept art and show like idea documents or, or references to other things. Um, with Bloxworld, for example, we have the scientist on board, so we know that we were going to have really cool algorith algorithms for visual scripting and that kind of stuff. That stuff we could start to talk about early. Um, we made some lectures at the local university, try the idea very, very early. No screenshots, no gameplay, nothing, but people started to get interested. Wow, that sounds really cool. So when will you launch the game? Yeah, maybe in two years or whatever. But so my personal opinion is, is as early as possible. I know that some people think the opposite, but uh, in my world, and that goes back also to, uh, to expose, yourself, uh, expose yourself for possibilities. The more you show the game, the more likely it is to someone to, uh, to see your game. And th something I can mention ties into this is that 
um, when we tried to get like our community to see our game, we tried some different things. We posted YouTube movies. We tried to be like very serious. We talked about like the unique selling points, and we listed features, and and how awesome it was based on science, scientific results, and stuff like that. No one cared. And then we made just a very very stupid movie because with Blocks World you can build anything, but that the thing you create doesn't really work. So we made fun of ourselves, saying like with Blocks World you can build anything. You can build a motorcycle that flips over. You can build a car that you can't really drive. You can build a uh, minions that just run away, and that got us traction. So use humor and be fun. <laughs> yeah. Next question. Um, can you name uh, any uh, marketing ideas that were actually bad that you know people didn't buy, or on the opposite side, could you name any ideas that were pretty you know awesome and crazy that actually uh, sold the game? Um, you mean uh, mention game titles? You, any ideas you encountered, you know, uh, while working in games? Yeah, a, the, a game that's that was announced very recently that I kind of love. Um, there's a Swedish developer called Coffee Stain Games, and uh, during a game jam very recently, they made a goat simulator. Have you heard about it? Goat simulator. Yeah. So the, it's silly, and and I don't think they had any ideas of like let's make a silly game. It will be huge. They just made it. They had a couple of beers and they. You know, came up with this crazy idea and they coded it together. And they posted a YouTube movie that is totally silly. Like I mentioned the, with, with the Bloxwell movie, with showing his things that doesn't work. The physics simulation is so crazy. You just control a goat that's just running around and acting crazy. Um, but it got so much traction. So over a week, they had several millions of views. And like the community demanding, you have to release this game. When will you release it? And they were like, no, it's just a game jam. It's, it's just a funny demo. No, you have to do it. So they suddenly turned around and said that, okay, internet, <laughs> we will give you the game. And we're like, wow, and now they have like five million guys like waiting for the game. So using humor and, and unexpected things, I think Goat Simulator is, is awesome. Personally, I, I, I always get fun out of these minimalistic games. I'm not sure, I, I think there's something with my brain, but as I mentioned, like Thomas Was Alone or like vector graphics games, I would love to see a game just using one pixels. One pixel, because that I get curious. I have to see that. How could you make a game with one pixel? Stuff like that. Okay, I don't know if that makes sense. But <laughs> Do we have a final question from the floor? No, Thomas, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thanks for coming along. You're great. Okay.